Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here. Today we are looking at Uncanny X-Men number 143, a very um, classic issue for so many reasons. Um, most notably, it is John Byrne's last issue on the title. So I cannot wait to show it to you guys. Um, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Hit that like button and let's get right into it. Uh, I thought it'd be fun. I just did... Um, the latest volume five of um, John Byrne's X-Men Elsewhere fan fiction um, depicting um, the story what if Jean Grey had survived the Dark Phoenix saga and John Byrne had stayed on the book to tell the tale without Chris Claremont. <clears throat> anyway, the, the book uh, that I just covered is issues 25 of 30. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it is John Byrne's X-Men fan fiction that he is doing on um, publishing on a John Byrne bulletin board called, board called Byrne Robotics for free. I'll try to remember to link it in the description here. It's just my latest video before this one, basically. And anyway, um, they do, he does a follow-up to this story. Like, this is like such a great story. This is definitely like, put Kitty Pride on the map as far as, like, being an X-Men fan favorite and just really showed her holding her own and made her so relatable and just such a great Kitty Pride issue. And kind of a fun note, I guess, for Byrne to depart on. Um, Byrne, you know, notoriously left the book because of uh, creative differences with Chris Claremont. And, um, you know, uh, they just undeniably created some of the most legendary uh, runs in X-Men and pretty much, you know, launched the popularity of the X-Men, which, you know, had been saved from cancellation um, and had kind of a mired history. This cover is so great. I love the Merry Christmas and that sort of like old English font. I love the old Marvel Comics group banner across the top. You know, feel the way you feel. The comics code was very damaging to the comics industry in a lot of way. Um, I'm not familiar as far as, like, I feel like there were different things, and I'm not sure what this is here with the CC. 50 cents, imagine this. This is before I started buying comic books um, regularly myself. Um, comics were more expensive when I started, but um, I did definitely, like... Uh, <clears throat> 20 issues later, come into the Uncanny X-Men with 163, maybe 164. Um, no, I think it was 163. Anyway. Um, but also a Kitty cover. Hmm, interesting. I always love Kitty. You know, she definitely gets credit, I think, for um, drawing in a younger fan base to the group. Um, this cover is notable because it's a Terry Austin cover. Um, Before... I, I think I used to feel like it was a burn cover and it just goes to show what Terry Austin really brought to the um, table artistically because um, it's very much, you know, in line with what he and Byrne did together. Love this corner box art, like such classic burn heads there. Like the team never looks better than they do right here. I just love that. There's something so classic about this. Now, I to me, this was a back issue. Um, having come into it later. So ironically, um, my first real introduction to Byrne was probably more like Fantastic Four and Alpha Flight, and I'm getting his X-Men in back issues, being completely blown away and just be like gobsmacked, for lack of a, you know, common American expression to describe how awestruck I was. Look at the beautiful artistry of Terry Austin's inks, just like the thickness and thinness of his lines and the use of Zipatones and Storm's um, cape, and the fact that, like, this is all hand-inked, and he's having to use, like, French curves and all these, like, old-school tools that, that they can easily do and procreate in Photoshop now. And Byrne would probably be, like, copying and pasting these demons, maybe. I don't know. But not back in the day, it's all hand-drawn. If you ever get an opportunity to... Um, get like the artist edition of the X-Men and just like you can see like the fine detail and the nuances of the inking and the pencils and they're just gorgeous. Anyway, love this. Um, 
You know, I feel like Byrne and um, Austin's run on the X-Men had a lot of double page spreads. And while this is not a double page spread, it carries through in that it's kind of cinematic and in a way that it just like goes across the entirety of the page rather than just being on one page across the top and the bottom. So that's a great effect. A lot of great storytelling going on in here. The storm I love, like this is like the perfect storm for me. I love the burn woman face at the time. His faces is, have evolved through the years. He's definitely at a good point with his art right now, killing it on X-Men Elseman. So, I mean, I always love John Bernard. John Bernard to me is like pizza, like even in the worst uh, John Bernard, it's still delicious. So I'll take it. You know, it all depends on his anchor and everything. And I definitely am a disciple of the church of Burn and Austin because they just did so many great things. And Terry Austin is just still such a skilled artist um, it, and just clearly has such a like a deft hand and love for inking or just at least a true mastery of it. Like he's never not using multiple techniques on every pages and giving you so many different textures and effects. The great storytelling going on here. It's great too, because it's like, you know, we now, our comic book art definitely uh, post image era, you know, always has like less panels, bigger money shots. I mean, I suppose if you look more um, at like some independent books and things like that. They're getting back into the nuts and bolts of the great depth storytelling like this. But I love that this has like eight panels on the page and it still has this great money shot here that's so full of like terror and emotion and just such a great artistic thing going on. I love this splash page here. Um, very much setting the mood and the tone and it's like that's at john Byrne at his best you know what i mean the characters are smaller it's like a great establishing shot and i feel like i don't know who's responsible for this um if it was Byrne or tom orzakowski i really feel like it was Byrne. like i can't imagine tom orzakowski taking it upon himself to do like this great thing although maybe he did he seems like to have an art artistic um level to his letters at some point so i don't think it's like beneath him or beyond him i should say but um i'm not sure that that would happen and now i want to have to look at my artist edition to see if this page is in there which i feel like i would have remembered if it did and i love the pattern on xavier's blanket on his wheelchair i love the pattern on kitty's shirt you know very 70s even though, though it's 1980 i guess we're clinging on to the 70s this is very much in line with burn like um you know technology and sort of even though it looks dated in like a you know big multi-computer kind of way um but that was you know sci-fi at the time but i just love it the detail and just the way austin inks it and like I'm saying, like the texture in the painting back here, the texture in the carpet, you know, these are all like flourishes and touches of Terry Austin's gorgeous inks. And just like the variances in the line weight, like in Xavier's face and like just like the difference between the front of his skull and the back of his skull where the line gets super thick and they go super deep into the cheekbone. I mean, that's so terrific. And the texture of like Nightcrawler's trans, uh, like teleportation effect. I mean, I guess it's all these like signature things that exist in the X-Men that, you know, owe a lot probably to people like John Byrne and Dave Cockrum and, you know, the uh, early artists. It's funny rereading this because sometimes I reread the comics and sometimes I don't. I mean, I'm basically here for the art and the nostalgia of it, but I was rereading this. And wow, <laughs> even though, you know, it's like part of the reason that I've always loved the X-Men is because of the detail and everything like that. And he definitely has the reputation for it, but wow, is this verbose. I mean, there's a lot on here, not just the captions, but like Kitty's thought balloons. Yet, in a way, and this shows how, why <laughs> this era of comics was so much better. It's like, I feel like you're getting like a, what would take like six issues to tell now because of their like 
odd pacing. Maybe not odd pacing, but like they're, yeah, I mean, I guess it's not realistic for somebody to have all this exposition while they're going through this. But that's like the beauty of comics. It's like, you know, it's like utilizing the art form in a way, you know, it's like, especially at this era, they had 17 pages a month. So you have to establish, you know, pre-existing characters. You have to um, show their relationships with each other. And you have to like sort of incorporate new elements, introduce new characters, tell new stories, and, you know, keep it exciting, keep the action going. And the balance of that was just like, so right on and just like what made me such a huge comic book fan at the time. I love this angle that is so effective. <clears throat> There's a lot of like, um, this is sort of like a teenage slasher flick because um, Kitty's home alone at the mansion being stalked by this monster mixed with like an alien horror film. Like it's funny because she even alludes to it. She's like, if this were the part in the movie, something like that. But I just love it. I love this face. I love her big eye. Like the pacing and this like, I don't know. Just the action of this is like so good. And once again, here we have freaking Terry Austin. Like there's the reflection in the wooden floor. There's the reflection in the mirror. There's like this little pebbling in the floor here. This cutaway view of her being chased by the demon. Now she can face, but it's been established that, um, you know, this is very new in her powers too, you know? Um, so I have to say she's handling it quite well going on. Like she, I feel like she discovered, like, I don't know, like, can she hold her facing for a great length of time at this period? I don't know. I love how this is colored. I love how like it's darker under the stairs and then the yellow is, looks almost greenish to reflect that. Like just goes to show like, how all the elements came together so well on the X-Men. I just love this so much. See, this is keeping with, like, this is, <laughs> for composition and storytelling of a comic book page, like, there's a Z formation. It's supposed to guide your eye across the page. And just masters of storytelling. Love that cutaway view. Just love it. It is so good. <laughs> it's almost like, um, like the better superhero version of the family circus where they have like Billy, like being followed all over the house. I I would give like almost anything for there to be a double page spread <laughs> of uh, Burn and Austin sort of channeling. I mean, this could still happen. Channeling Bill Keen and um, doing, oh, if I had like endless money, I would commission Burn to do this and just have him do like whatever route Kitty went through. Hey, fan fictioners, that's an idea for you. Somebody draw like above the mansion and show like the demon chasing Kitty through in a family circus parody. Am I gonna have to do that myself again? <clears throat> Comic books for sale. Look at these cheap comics. I wonder, I'm sure they have X-Men. Yeah, X-Men. Um, number six and seven for $25. That seems like a giant size X-Men was already 60 bucks. Although, I mean, like, that must be outrageous now. I'm thinking this book, like, sadly not. I don't think it was in the best shape when I bought it used to begin with. But, you know, I mean, 1980. That's a long time ago, guys. Um such great use of like once again I mean this is just like non-stop action that's such a great effective use like I love Kitty's eyes like the just showing her eyes like says it all and I don't know I love this this effect here the shadow of the danger room now I almost felt like I detected um a no prize because Kitty had said that since she was home alone, she was um, in uh, programming it herself. She was only able to do like a sort of workout um, danger room scenario and not a combat one. That's why she's just doing like gymnastics and stuff, which she's already been established as a dancer and a gymnast. So that makes sense. And she's like lamenting, like, why do we have to do this? And I love it because that's like Chris Claremont just like doing great storytelling and sort of, you know, I mean, remembering that 
comic books are read by children and he's still still sort of instilling like values and teaching less lessons like she you know she's kind of like why do i have to do this stupid x-men stuff and then she fights a demon and wins and she's like okay this is why we do it now i understand about those darn exercises by the way, if you're getting bored, there's a reason to stick around to the end of the video because Kurt Busiak writes a fan letter in here. And I didn't even read the whole thing. I can't wait to see what it has to say. And also a farewell note from Chris Claremont. How fun is that? I just love that so much. Like this Marvel House ad for the subscriptions were always so cool, especially like the Christmas ones. I mean, come on, a wreath with all their hats on it. That is so great. Dazzler, like what a cool logo that was. I wonder who did that. Um, very shiny and metallic. Love it. It's funny because my brother had just read, um, reread Dazzler and was like singing its praises, even though he hates John Romita Jr., I hate him less than I used to, and I love him a lot on certain things. I kind of forgot that he had done Dazzler, and I see that if it's inked by Alfredo Alcala, that's, like, very cool. Like, I'm sure the art is pretty cool on that. I love the way Kitty looks here. I love everything about this page. This is, like, the even though it's clearly, like, an alien ripoff, I feel, obviously. You know, she's, like... <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure Ripley did something like that at some point. I love the way that, um, it's funny because I, you know, I'm a new X-Men fan. Like I never cared about the old X-Men before, you know, in the black and yellow costumes, but somehow like I always loved Kitty in it. And I always loved the way that especially Byrne and um, Austin drew her in it. And that's such a great eye. One thing that I noticed earlier is that as much as I love Tom, Tom Orzakowski's lettering, he seems to sometimes use a very egregious amount of bubbles connecting the thought balloons. There was an example of it. I mean, that's fine. I can't believe I'm gonna criticize something like that, but it just seemed weird. I was just like, that just seemed like way too much. It was like, you got to trust the reader to sort of know that maybe the only person in the panel is the one doing the thinking. But it's important. I mean, you know, this is the day of no prizes. The last thing you want is the no prize for, like, pointing thought bubbles at the demon when it's Kitty supposed to be thinking. Like, that could have probably done with three. I don't know. Whatever. Tom Orsakowski's legendary letter. I'm not going to question him. And then the X-Men leave Kitty alone on Christmas Eve, which I guess is fine since she's Jewish, but also she's left alone on Hanukkah. But then the X-Men come home and the parents come home and everything's fine. And then we have this freaking hostess ad, which of course is amazing. So, I mean, I can't think of a better way to end the book than of course Storm looking gorgeous and fabulous. Um, and a very cute looking Kitty Pride. I love the way that Byrne draws her so much anyway. So we will, there is a better way to end this actually. And we will end it first, part one, with Chris Claremont's parting shot at Burn leaving, who Burn said nothing. Anyway, we open with an announcement, one that in many ways, I wish I didn't have to write in many ways. It's just kind of funny because uh, Claremont's always been super diplomatic about the supposed rift between them, whereas Byrne has been a little more vocal. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, uh, Claremont for the win, you know, keep it classy. Anyway, uh, as many of you no doubt, this having been widely reported in the various comic news magazines, of course, this is before the internet, John Byrne has resigned as penciler on the X-Men this is his last issue. It is also Terry Austin's last issue as anchor of the book. In all my years as a writer, I have never worked with as good a creative team, as nice a pair of people as John and Terry. Together, they reached Olympian levels of artistic quality and consistency. They will be missed. That's the sad news. Now for the good stuff. After next issue's superlative interim art job by Brent Anderson, and it's amazing. I'm going to cover it um, coming up. 
uh, one of the finest young pencilers working in comics today. The penciling reigns. It's even better than I feel like the, the graphic novel God Loves Man Kills. It's really good. Anyway, we'll be returned to the man who co-created the new X-Men in the first place, Dave Cockrum. His initial issue is already finished. And believe me, it's a knockout. Nothing lasts forever. And any change, no matter how beneficial it may turn out to be, is wrenching. Uh, Dave's departure three years ago closed the first chapter in the history of the new X-Men. John and Terry's departure closes the second. I wish them well, and I really look forward to the next three years we'll bring. Your response to the best book has been really phenomenal. I and Dave intend to keep it that way. So I guess, um, Dave would last probably like two years, and then Paul Smith would come on, and then Romita Jr. would last quite a while. Like, um, I'll have to figure that out. Anyway, <clears throat> so this is the best way to end this on this fan letter. And I, I'm going to put air quotes around that because I think he complains as any good fan would. Kurt Busiek, who would go on to write Marvel's Marvel, Marvel's Marvels with Alex Ross. You say what? To the editor, I have a complete collection of X-Men. My first issue was number 37. Since then, I've been an avid fan of the book through the old and new teams. But 138 is my last issue. I quit. The change from the old X-Men to the new X-Men was fairly simple to adjust to because the book was still excellently scripted and drawn. But for the past two years since number 113, I've watched the book degenerate. <laughs> Watch the X-Men become a perversion of what they once were. Watch you twist and mangle characters you virtually created. First, I decided to stop during the Hellfire Club storyline, but held on for sentimental reasons and vague hope that things would get better. During the Dark Phoenix story, I again decided to quit, but upon hearing that what the conclusion would be, decided to stick around till Psychops left. And now I can no longer justify buying the X-Men, not even to keep my collection complete. Each issue hurts too much. I love the X-Men, and if you treated them as they deserve, I would still be a faithful supporter. But until matters change, you've lost yourself a reader. Bam! Kurt Busiek. Wow, that was hardcore. Can you imagine that? Like, everyone else is, like, sliving for the Dark Phoenix saga, and Kurt Busiek is, like, quitting for it. I wonder what happened. Um, <laughs> like, I wonder, like, is this common knowledge? It has to be. I'm sorry you feel the way you do, Kurt. Unfortunately, one person's dark age is another's renaissance. What you saw as a perversion of the book and its characters, others saw as some of the finest issues of the series. Amen. We do our best to make our readers happy, a logical course of action, considering that if they become unhappy, they wouldn't read the book and it and we wouldn't be here. But the way we do that is by trusting our own instincts and abilities. So long as we produce these books, all comics, not simply X-Men, are creative humans, not pre-grammable, programmable robots. That's the way it has to be for better or for worse, hopefully for better, Chris. Wow. So that's kind of interesting because obviously it shows that, um, I mean, interesting mostly because, you know, it's Kurt Busiak bitching about Chris Claremont and John Burns X-Men. But um, it just goes to show that fandom, um, you know, was pretty much the same even before the internet. The internet just exposed everything. That's my takeaway lesson for the day. Anyway, wasn't that awesome? John Burns' last issue of the X-Men. 50 cents worth every penny. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder how much this is worth, even given the wear and tear. Such a great classic book. Um, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Hit like, share my content, and I'll bring you some more soon. Thanks, guys.